The original Hebrew language brings the Bible to life in amazing ways. In Genesis 1-1, we know it says, in beginning. We say, in the beginning. In beginning. That's Bereshit. Bet, Resh, Aleph, Shin, Yod, and Tav. And originally Hebrew was written with symbols. The pictographic symbol for Aleph is like an ox head, and it represents strength. Bet is tent or house. Ab, Aleph, Bet, Abba, father, the strength of the house. Aleph, strength. Bet, tent or house. Resh is a head, a little picture of a head. And we know that B and R together, bar, son of. Aleph is God, the strength, the strength of the tent, Aleph Beit. God of beginnings, the creator. Some say it's technically correct for the written version of scripture to begin with Aleph, but God does not do that in the Holy Bible. He places bar first. He places the son first. So Aleph Beit, father, Ab, Abba, the strength of the tent is God. And Beit Resh, bar, son of. So, in the first word of the Bible just there, in the first three letters of the Old Testament, we have the Son of God with a language that is thousands of years old. Hold on, it gets crazier. Beit Resh Aleph, then Sheen. The symbol is like teeth. It represents destruction or devouring. Yod is an outstretched hand and arm, and it represents work or doing something. And finally, Tav is a T, one's mark. One makes a mark or a cross. So when you lay out the pictographs for Hebrew, for Bereshit, and take the meaning with the phonetics of each letter and what the letter combinations mean, you get the Son of God, Betresh Aleph, is destroyed, Shin, by the work of his own hand, Yod, willingly on a cross, Tav. Yeah, the Bible is that deep. The Son of God is destroyed by the work of his own hand, willingly on a cross. Better sheet. The Gospel of John chapter 20 verse 7 tells us that the napkin which was placed over the face of Jesus was not just thrown aside in a piled up manner like the grave clothes. John 20 verse 7, And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. The Bible actually takes an entire verse to tell us that the napkin was neatly folded and was placed separate from the grave clothes. Early Sunday morning, the day of Jesus' resurrection, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance of the burial site. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples and said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and I don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciples ran to the tomb to see, while the other disciple John, fast on his feet, outran Peter and got there first. He stopped and looked in and saw the linen cloth laying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying to the side. Now the reason the cloth was gently folded and laid to the side was because it had such an important significance and only goes to show you how special every little word in the Word of God is. But in order to understand the significance of this folded napkin, you must first have to understand a little bit about Hebrew tradition of that day. The folded napkin had to do with the master and the servant, and every Jewish boy knew this tradition. When the servant set the dinner table for the master, he made sure that it was exactly the way the master wanted it. The table was furnished perfectly, and then the servant would wait, just out of sight, until the master had finished eating. And the servant would not dare to touch that table until the master was finished. Now, if the master were done eating, he would rise from the table, wipe his fingers, his mouth, and clean his beard, and would wad up that napkin and toss it onto the table. The servant would then know to clear the table. For in those days, the wadded napkin meant, I'm done, or I'm finished. But if the master got up from the table and folded his napkin and laid it beside his plate, the servant would not dare to touch the table because the folded napkin meant, I'm coming back. So the Bible took a whole verse to describe to us the napkin that was folded was because Jesus is coming back. Revelation 22, 20. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. So if you were just as surprised and mind blown by this message as I was, give me a thumbs up. Hidden message number three is the time prophecy of Methuselah. Methuselah was a character in the Bible whose name meant his death shall bring as described earlier. But you're probably thinking just as I was when I discovered this truth, his death shall bring what? Well, let's dig deeper. Methuselah was a father of Lamech and the grandfather of Noah. I'm prepared to have your mind blown because when I realized this, I saw even more how scripture is truly given by the inspiration of God. Anyways, scripture tells us that Methuselah had Lamech when he was 182 years old and lived another 782 years longer until his death. 
And remember, his name means his death shall bring. So when Methuselah died, something tragic happened. But let's go to the verse so we can see it crystal clear. Genesis 5, 25-28 Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. And after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. So let's do a little math here. If we take that 187 plus the 782, you get 969, which is the exact year Scripture said Methuselah died. Now also remember that Methuselah was the grandfather of Noah, and Scripture interpreted that when Noah was 600 years old, that's when the flood came. Genesis 7-6, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters was upon the earth. Now you probably know exactly what I'm leading to here. When Methuselah died, the flood came. You take the numbers, the Bible provided 187 plus the 182 plus the 600, you get the 969, which is the exact year Methuselah died and the flood came. It's amazing how Methuselah was also recorded as the longest living person in the Bible. And Methuselah's name, meaning his death shall bring the flood, it just shows how much of a loving God we have. He gave people 969 years from the time that that man was born to prepare for the flood. That just shows the extreme extensiveness of God's mercy. There's another place that God appears to have laid out his plan in advance and that's in some subtleties and one of which I'd like to share with you in Genesis chapter 5. In Genesis chapter 5 we have a genealogy. The genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 goes from Adam, the first man, down through Noah. And in Genesis chapter 5, if you wade through that, I encourage you to make a list of the names. Adam gives, uh, gave birth to Seth. Seth, Enosh. Enosh, Kenan. Kenan, Mahalal. Mahalal, Jared. Jared, Enoch. Enoch, Methuselah. Methuselah, Lamech. And Lamech was the father of Noah. Let's take these names. Ten names. But see, the problem is we need to know what the names mean. And if you have a study Bible or a source, a, a lexicon, what have you, you know that the name Adam means man. As you go through your Bible, when these names are typically first introduced, most of your marginal footnotes will tell you what the name means. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalel means the blessed God. Jared means, shall come down. Enoch means, teaching. Methuselah means, his death shall bring. Lamech means, the despairing. And the word Noah means, rest or comfort. Now, let's read that genealogy as a sentence. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort. Isn't that wild? Here is a summary, a one sentence summary of the Christian gospel tucked away in a genealogy in the Torah, in the book of Genesis, in the, in, in, in specifically in the book of Genesis. It has several implications. First of all, it demonstrates that God's plan of redemption was not a knee-jerk reaction to Adam's sin. He knew before Adam was uh, created that he would, if given the chance, he would get himself in a predicament that nothing less than the death of God himself would avail to, re to uh, extricate him from that predicament. So it's a summary in that sense. But on the other, there's another aspect of this, even more practical in, in, in an apologetic sense. There's no way that you will ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide a summary of the Christian gospel in a genealogy in the Torah? No way. No, this is a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit. Now, you don't build doctrine... Do <coughs> You don't build doctrine from these things. It has the same role in my mind that the little metal strip in your $20 bill has. It proves that the $20 bill is authentic. And when you find these structures hidden under the text, it doesn't change your understanding of the text. It simply authenticates its origin and, it's, and it's, it vindicates its, uh, its authority. 
So we have one integrated design here. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. Here's an example. And the Old Testament, of course, is in the New Testament revealed. So again, I want to underscore the basic pillars of our ministry, the thing that, that our, the focus that makes us somewhat distinctive is based on two discoveries. The first discovery is that these 66 books that we have in our laps called the Bible, even though they were penned by over 40 different guys over thousands of years, they are an integrated message system. Every detail of those 66 books is there by design, a design that could not be anticipated by the penmen over those thousands of years, but it all fits together. It's just like you you've built, uh, you find a bunch of pieces and you put them together and find that they're a perfectly meshed jigsaw puzzle with no pieces missing and no pieces left over. You begin to realize that was designed, it wasn't by accident. Now if you go that far in your understanding, you need, and again, you need to discover that for yourself. But once you discover that for yourself, there's another insight that emerges and that is that the origin of that message system had to come from outside the dimensionality of time. Because not just the content, but the structures anticipate the contact, the uh, uh, content that's coming, and uh, 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 that demonstrates it comes from outside the space-time domain. And once you discover that, it alters your entire approach and understanding of the Bible. You'll have an awe or a reverence that comes no other way. This is uh, Genesis chapter one in Hebrew. Now. I want to remind you that Hebrew goes from right to left. Also, the word Torah in Hebrew is spelled with four letters. A Ta, which is roughly equivalent to our T, an O, a Resh, a He, um, four letters. If you go to the first Tau in the book of Genesis, and uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet that happens, and you count 49 letters, you come to a Vav, you count 49 more letters, and you come to a resh, which is sort of like our R, and you count 49 more letters, you come to a he. So that is four, those four letters spelled Torah. Now I need to remind you that all languages flow towards Jerusalem. Did you know that? All nations east of Jerusalem go from right to left. All nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. I don't know what you're going to do with that piece of information, <laughs> but I think it's interesting. Now, you can follow this without knowing Hebrew, probably, but you say, now, why 49? Was the square of seven? Okay, that's fine. That's not, that, not too surprising, but just a coincidence, of course. Or is it? Now, you could argue, well, that's just an accident of the frequency of letters and so forth. It's kind of rare, but interesting. Except what happens is when you go to the book of Exodus, you go to the first tau, Count 49 letters, you get a vav. 49 letters, you get a resh. 49 letters, and you get a hey. Same thing happens. What's the probability of that? Whatever the first probability is, it's that squared. <laughs> okay? So it's very unlikely. Genesis, Exodus, you go to Leviticus, and it doesn't happen. And when it doesn't, you almost feel a sigh of relief. Huh? But when you go to Numbers, the same thing happens it backwards. You take the first hey, the first resh, the first vav, the first tau, you get Torah spelled backwards. Now that's weird. What's weird, if nothing else, I don't know how they found this out. They must have had time on their hands. You know. They didn't have computers. You know, this was you go to Deuteronomy, you have essentially the same equivalent thing happens. And now you're puzzled because you've got it forward, forward, backward, backward can't resist going back to Leviticus and looking at Leviticus more closely. We have 49 and 7 squared letter sequences, Torah, Torah, forward in Genesis, Exodus, uh, backwards in Numbers and Deuteronomy. When you look at Leviticus, you discover that every seventh letter spells the unpronounceable name of God, often rendered Jehovah or Yahweh. Trans, uh, re, re uh, uh, expresses Adonai among the Hebrews. They won't pronounce that name. They'll use Lord, the word Lord instead. Well, now we stand back from all of this. We have the, the name of God, and we suddenly realize that the Torah always points to the name of Jehovah. Now, what's the chance of that happening by accident? 
And by the way, if you've tried to contrive something like this and still maintain logic in the text, that's a challenge. This is a very non-trivial thing to design if you set out to design it that way. So uh, many of us tend to regard these kinds of things in general as fingerprints of the Holy Spirit.